San Francisco. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? Because we're about to defy convention. Polite society will tell you that you should take the disc out of disability, but here tonight in the Women's Center, we're going to get dissed. So I want to thank the organizers, the Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Give it up. Give it up. That's better. The Paul K. Longmore Institute on Disability at San Francisco State University. Now, Superfest has a long, illustrious history, both within film festivals and within disability, arts, and culture. For years, for decades, for over a century now in cinema, they have been, been doing disability about us, but not with us, right? Disability without us. They have taken their notions of what disability is, what they consider it to be, what they fear it might be, what their hopes are for what we should be, and putting that up on the silver screen. But tonight, over a century after Thomas Edison did The Fake Beggar in 1898, one of the first films, 52 seconds long, had a guy sitting on a street corner, supposedly legless, with a sign begging for money, you know, as we do. And the coin that gets tossed into his cup misses. And by impulse, he jumps up to grab the coin. <gasps> the secret is revealed. He's a charlatan. He's a scammer. Right? He's working the system. Have you seen 60 Minutes lately? It's all the rage. This American life is talking about it. But Thomas Edison first put that out there in 1898. And then, without our know-how, without our consent, they said, yeah. That notion is what disability is. Tonight, October 12th, in San Francisco, we take it back. This is ours. How are you doing tonight? Good. I'm good, I'm good. It's excited. great. Very excited. There's never been anything like this, and it's so, what a good crowd already, and we're, we're really eager and excited. Thank you for coming out tonight. Oh yeah, I wouldn't miss it. What, what brings you out? Well, I, um, I work in the film industry, actually. Okay. So going to an event that really is kind of looking at disability in film is really important to me. And uh, Lawrence Carter Long, who's going to be a part of the commentary tonight, I've known him for a few years. And so any chance to see him when he's on the West Coast, I want to come out and see him. Was there anything about this event in particular that's different from a lot of the other um, disability film events that you've done? Yeah, I think, you know, Superfest has a long history, right? It was the first in the United States to sort of say, we're going to take this, we're going to claim this, we're going to show it from our perspective. Um, it's great to see with the muscle of the Lighthouse and the Longmore Institute um, that it's going to be continuing, it's going to be moving into sort of that next gen, that next era. You know, I think bigger, badder, stronger than ever. Um, and really taking its place where it needs to be among, you know, the variety of disability film festivals are out there. There need to be more of us everywhere. And I think there's room for many different perspectives, but we can never lose sight of disabled people doing it for themselves, you know, and reclaiming that spot and really giving it um, the attention of what our own experiences bring to that and what our own scholarship brings to that and pointing that lens back, turning that back around. We always need to keep that in mind, and we all, I think it always needs its place in the center of any of the work that we do. Nothing holds that like Superfest, so I'm pleased to see it moving forward. You know, for all of that time, Hollywood has tried to take disability and shoehorn it into these little limited categories, right? We're tragic. Get out your handkerchiefs. We're heroic. Cue the Rocky music. Right? We're inspirational. Now, I don't, 
oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is audience participation, please. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but being inspirational all the time is damn exhausting. <laughs> Sometimes I just want to go to the store and get my beer. <laughs> why do I have to explain to you why I walk this way, how I walk this way, how I had to climb every mountain in order to get to the store? Sometimes I just want to drink. <laughs> so tonight, we take what they think we're about, and we put it back in their faces. We've got seven categories spanning the history of disability in cinema. But before we get into the program itself, I know that Corbett O'Toole has been out there stomping her feet, screaming, yelling, haranguing, bugging, annoying, trying to say forever that we need to take Hollywood on on its own terms. Superfest was shepherded for decades by culture, disability, talent, and we're moving into the new era, right? The next stage, the next gen, oration of Superfest, and to hand off to do the ceremonial passing of the torch Corbett O'Toole is going to hand it off to Brian and Kathy. So let's take care of that. Don't drop the candy. I want some of those. Okay. Why are you doing Superfest differently this year? Um, we decided, we took it over um, from the, the previous organizers. They were looking to turn it over to somebody new. So we decided, well, what can we do to make it edgy and, and fun and kind of change film viewing. There's a lot of film festivals out there now and people go and they quietly sit in their little chairs and they watch a film and we thought, well, what would, what would it be like to really get an interactive film experience and you bring in audio description of, of films um, so blind people can benefit, but you'll see tonight the audio description is going to be very different than the usual fair. We've built it all in to the program and so everybody can enjoy it. What about the um, audio description? I mean, I've actually had the chance to uh, hear audio description that's like kind of comes with films before yeah. and it's very monotone and this is very different from that. So. This was so much fun. It was edgy, it was lighthearted, and it just had a familiar feeling. All the other stuff sounds like you're watching public television and you're hearing some official biography, and this is how people really think and talk. I think it will set a standard for how we really want to be described or how a friend might describe a video or a movie that you're seeing. CDT was wonderfully innovative, brought, Superfest to the Bay Area in 1998. It was, it's been a wonderful run that we've had with showing different films from people who were talking about disability and thinking about disability and presenting ourselves for ourselves. And that had not happened before Superfest. The time has come for us to pass this wonderful torch to the next generation of leaders who are going to bring Superfest where it needs to go next. So we want to thank very much the Lighthouse and thank very much the Longmore Institute. And I am passing you this wonderful erupting <laughs> <laughs> symbol of abundance. Uh, can you tell me about uh, past experiences at other Superfests that you've been to? It's been it's been a while since I've been to one, but uh, I've been twice, and I loved it each time. It was just a whole series of movies that are disability related, and yeah, it's great. In fact, I even met one of the I even met a woman I saw in one of them at a at a party, so that was really exciting. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Yeah, yeah. Why was it so important um, to do the Dissies? Well, we're really looking forward to getting back to the good films next year. But this year, we wanted to do something, um, something different and something that takes time to notice that even though things are getting better, we still have a really long way to go. And uh, there's still a lot of, you know, I, I was the main person who accepted nominees from the community. And I, I received so many nominees from people who said, you know, this film, I saw it when I was a kid, and, and I thought, 
so that's what I'm supposed to be like? That's what I'm supposed to be if I'm blind, if I'm in a wheelchair? And, you know, that, that causes a lot of harm still. And so, yes, we want to celebrate the good, but we needed to take a year to, to talk about the bad in order to, to do something productive with it, to be empowered by, you know, shouting back at these films and, and, and letting them know that they're, they're not on the right track. If you look, and you'll definitely see it, obvious here tonight that the history of disability in cinema has tended to be sappy, safe, and sentimental. Any time that a movie about disability came out, you could pretty much rest assured that that's what it was going to be. It would fit into those limited parameters. You would have your tragic disabled character who had some fate befall them in life. You would have your heroic disabled character who had risen above that tragedy. Or you would have maybe a monster, right? A phantom from the opera, the hunchback of Notre Dame, or, or uh, any one of those characters who were outside of society. Those were safe bets. And as people saw those depictions of disability reinforced over and over and over again, they moved out of the realm of fantasy and into people's minds because they didn't see anything else. Think about it. A lot of us were in institutions at that time, right? We weren't out in the public eye, so the only way people knew anything about disability was what came into their houses or what came into the theater that they went to. So you first see the disabled monster, the outsider, and then you see it again, and then you see basically every film that Lon Chaney ever made, and you begin to think, oh, those people are scary, right? But then some would try to be sympathetic, and they'd turn that back around, and so you'd get Charlie Chaplin doing something like City Lights and The Blind Girl, right? So you have some sympathy, oh, she's blind. That's too bad. Isn't Charlie sweet? Right? And then you get those that'll overcome. And so we wanted to circumvent that. We wanted to sort of put that in people's faces, sort of taking a page from Superfest. And so the way I talked about it was no handkerchief necessary, no heroism required. And I had a guy from The Hollywood Reporter say to me, well, what do you show then? <laughs> I won't say his name, but it's a direct quote, I swear. And I said, exactly. That's why we need to exist, and that's why we're here tonight at Superfest to do the Dissies. I think this is going in a new direction. I think this film festival is taking it in a new direction. Obviously, we were irre irreverent, hopefully not irrelevant, irreverent. And um, what I think is going to be really unique about what comes out of this is that we will learn how to be an audience we will learn how to be media literate in a different way, or relearn. I think that small groups know how to do it, where you know, friends get together and they talk back to the television or, or you know, private showing or something like that of a, of a film. That's what's exciting to me. What are the dissies about? Well, I think we're here to discern, to pick apart. We're here to distinguish what's real and what's false. We're here to disrupt notions about what they expect us to be. We're here to put on display our notions, our reality, our truth, our experiences about disability. Way back in the 20s and before that, you know, there were more disabled actors. Uh -huh. um, you know, people with performers with disabilities who were cast as disabled characters, and for, for whatever reason, you know, the Hayes Code that sort of tapered off, and there was a real conservative, conservative um, force in the uh, in the in the film industry that sort of you know put a damper on that. People weren't getting the kind of roles that they had been. So it's good to see that sort of finally coming to a close and people getting the roles that they need. I mean, there are certainly disabled actors out there who are ready to work and want to work and can bring so much to the roles. So it's, it's great to see that happening again. We're here to take it back. Most of all, we're here 
to discover, to take a fresh look, listen, to what we think we already know through a whole new lens so that we can cleanse the palate a little bit before we move forward. So, as we reclaim, as we reframe, as we rediscover and take it all back, that's what the Dissies is about. It's community, it's homegrown, it's grassroots, it's not somebody coming in from another city, another state, another town saying, we know what's best for you. It's saying, no, 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 we were here first, pal. <laughs> and we're not going away. This is ours. It's tapping into that amazing arts and culture scene in San Francisco and the Bay Area, and that energy, that knowledge base, that artistic talent, that skill to manifest this, to move this baby forward. It's a whole new way of looking, thinking, and watching film. That's what the Dissies is about. The event is wonderful. It's absolutely amazing for us to be able to get together like this. At, from an insider's perspective, for us who know each other, who know these films, know what's wrong with them, to be able to point our fingers, to make it known how we really feel without having to hide those and pretend that we're somebody, something other than what we are. It's wonderful. We get to be authentic crips here. And that it, we don't get to do that very much. A lot of times we have to be out in the world and pretend to be, oh, I just happen to be sitting in this wheelchair, but I'm just like everybody else when I'm not just like everybody else. And here we get to be authentic, and it's wonderful. I see I just find it interesting with people seeing the stereotypes and laughing at them. So I'm here. We'll show the clips. I'll say a little bit about each film, just to give it a little context. And then after we give it a little context, here's what you get to do. You get to scream. I'll ask you to vote. I'll say for the first film, right? Second film, third film, fourth film. So you get to scream, yell, throw popcorn, stomp your feet, have a seizure, drool all over the person next to you. Whatever you want to do, whatever your thing is, we're going to ask you to do that, to make yourself known. And then our three very brave and inspirational judges over there get the task of deciding among themselves which category or which film in that category is the winner of a coveted Dissy. They will bring that up to me. And each person, each because, you know, some of these films were from the 30s or the 40s and they've since moved on or for some reason the director did not want to show up in person. We know that they couldn't get past Anne. <laughs> she didn't want to get her hands on him for a long time. Um, we've asked members of the community to give the acceptance speech for them. So members of the disability community, the arts and culture community here in the Bay Area will accept the award on their behalf. And then we'll describe, I want to describe uh, the awards. Can one of our Vannas, or one of our Vannas around here, we, the folks who are helping out with the awards and, uh, and getting the microphones ready, we're, we're calling them lovingly our Vanna Whites. Can, can you bring me one of the statuettes? Thank you. You gotta improv with this stuff. So I, I wanna do a little description. So elegant, everybody, good. give her a hand. Thank you. So these very special, one of a kind statuettes are golden bobbleheads. They're about four or five inches tall and they're shaped as Timmy from South Park. Talk about reclaiming, right? And taking it back. So each of the, Timmy, everybody, let's give me a Timmy. Timmy! All right. So the winners of a coveted Dissy will get their very own Dissy Award. Thank you very kindly. And. So let's break it down to the categories. I asked before, San Francisco, are you ready? 
to get dissed. Our first category, this was hard to decide on, the worst, absolute worst portrayal of a disability by a non-disabled actor. <laughs> Some things to think about. Yeah, ever notice, I feel I'm Andy Rooney all of a sudden, did you ever notice how many Oscars and awards go to non-disabled actors who play these parts? Right? Boo. boo! Let's hear a boo. Boo! They get to crip it up, right? Crip it up, put on their crip face, and then they walk away with the statue, right? And so with these clips, and let me tell you what, this was really tough to narrow down. I think what we're going to do is we're going to show them first. We've got three films for you. The first, and I just want to gauge your reactions before we show the clips. You ready? You ready for these? All right, let's give it the energy. The first film, Glenn Close. Can you guess? Can you guess? Fatal Attraction. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Glenn Close. Fatal Attraction, Ooh, all right, from 1987, all right? The second film, Richard Pryor, who became part of the family at some point there before his death. Gene Wilder, See No Evil, Hear No Evil, from 1989. Come on, give it up, give it up, give it up. And last, but definitely not least, just to show we're not picking on the 80s, <laughs> Gene Hackman in Young Frankenstein. Uh, Frankenstein. Yes, I caught myself. Mel Brooks. So, the clips, please. The dog licks pooled water by his paw. Dan looks up. Duh. <laughs> Overacting Alex raises the hand holding the knife to her forehead. Can I get the job? Wilder waves his hands in Pryor's face. You're really blind? Yes, I'm really blind, man. What? He moves the ladle Sometimes back and forth. The monster tries to follow it with the bowl. The soup pours in the monster's lap. All right, judges, you're conferring? All right. This is the exciting part. So, <laughs> the first, yes. Have, okay, you're writing? Have you made your decision? You have made, all right, can you bring me the decision, please? Can you give me a drum roll? People stop, yell, holler, scream. Build that anticipation, ah! And your winner is Gene Hackman, Young Frankenstein. Let's hear a boo, let's hear a big boo, boo. Accepting the award for Jean, who sadly could not be here this evening, is Georgina Cleage, author of Sight Unseen and UC Berkeley Lecturer. Georgina, can you join us up front? Can our Vannas be with Georgina there? Bring the Dissy. <laughs> <laughs> this is a moment in history, the first Dissy. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Lawrence, and thank you judges, and thanks to all of you, the, the glittering, glamorous crowd here tonight. I, I invite you all to turn to the people sitting next to you and tell them how fabulous they look. Yes, thank you. Thank you. You look fabulous. So do you. Oh, here, thank you. Um, if, you're, if you're blind, you can feel their faces. You can feel their faces <laughs> and their garments. <laughs> I'm very honored to accept this, this first Dissy ever. Um, Woo! Is he, is he bobbling? He's yeah. bobbling. Okay. Can we um, all have a Timmy? Wait, let's, 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 let's set this up. Yeah. One, two, three. Timmy! <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, Happy I, you this is the, the biggest category, the, the worst uh, a performance of disability by a non-disabled actor. If I think of just the category of um, uh, 
sighted women playing blind women in the movies. You think of Jane Wyman and Betty Davis and Audrey Hepburn and Uma Thurman and who's that woman in Patch of Blue and you know all those you Elizabeth know, uh, Elizabeth uh, something somebody yeah. Uh, <laughs> She, she faded into obscurity. I yeah, wonder after why. that, after well, what could she do after <laughs> that? Um, but anyway, so many, so many great performances not nominated. Um, but it is, uh, it is a, a, a great, a personal honor to accept this award for for Gene Hackman, uh, who, as as it's clear from his performance, consulted with many blind people um, about their their daily lives and um, how they lived them. Uh, and demonstrated why it is that no one wants to come to our houses for soup. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, th thanks, thanks to you all. I know, I know that Jean will be thrilled, just thrilled to have this award. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Georgina. Thank you to Arvana. Thank you very much. So. Another one of those themes that kept popping up as we were looking at the films and trying to decide was this trope. You know, a trope is sort of something that is heard so often, seen so often, known so often that becomes part of the culture, part of the society. And, and we kept seeing over and over the story where the adorable, perfect little white girl, it was always a little white girl, helps out the poor, pathetic, disabled person and gets away with it because of her cuteness, right? So in this category, we're, we're calling so sweet that they're not. We have Mary in the film The Secret Garden. You know the book, The Secret Garden, right? The film, yeah, ah, woo, 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 okay. Heidi in Heidi. See, you already know that one. You're already gearing up for that. And Pollyanna in Pollyanna. Is she as clueless as she seems to be? The clips. My. Adorable white Mary sits on the pathetic boy's bed. You feel real. I am. But there's nothing happy about a pair of crutches. Well, we were glad that we didn't have to use them. Amen. <laughs> she drags one foot then stand straight. Her father finally sees her as a human being. By the way, how about that audio description? So we're going to vote. I want to say some things about so sweet that they're not, I think I need a shot of like insulin or something after, after those. So you got Mary in the secret garden. Remember Mary? She was the first clip. Mary, right? This, I want, if you haven't seen it or read the book, this was their first meeting. Mary and Colin had never met before. The boy spends all his time in bed, moaning and groaning, fearing that he's going to look like Quasimodo, his father, at the end of the day. And he's, he's, you know, you could see he's kind of a spoiled brat because nobody calls him on his nonsense, right? And she just keeps saying, you know what, I'm going to go back to sleep. Smart girl. Um, but what do you have here, right? You've got that perfect, adorable girl that's going to call him out and help him come to his senses. Heidi. Oh, Heidi. Heidi, Heidi, Heidi. Now, this is the 1930s. I want to put this in context. Shirley Temple, America's sweetheart. No one cuter with the little ringlets, right? She even tap danced, for God's sakes. And what is Shirley Temple saying? What is she saying? She's saying, if you only try hard enough, you'll be able to walk again. Jerry Lewis, we could have been rid of Jerry Lewis for 40 years <laughs> if we had just known that. Part of the wider cure or perish, right? You don't get just to be your disabled self, right? You're either going to drop dead or some miraculous thing is going to cure you, right? Another thing that just, I don't know if it's a disability thing necessarily, but one of the things that gets me about the that clip is just how out of control cute that kid is. She's too cute. She's like so out of control cute that you just, you're, you start to twitch, you know, that it's really out of control there, over the top. But that's what, right, that's what you're expected to be. And to see that exemplified, you then have Pollyanna, right? 
don't look at the reality in front of you. <laughs> Crutches are not, the thing that gets me, the way that we talk in this country, right? Don't use that as a crutch. Wait a minute. What is a crutch for? What is a crutch for? Helps you walk. If you didn't have the damn crutch, you won't walk. So you'd think that a crutch would be pretty important, right? Your knee's a little weak, your ankle's feeling funky, use a damn crutch, right? But no, 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 you don't want to think about the crutch, you don't want to use the crutch, you got a sweet girl trying to make the whole damn town happy again. She's got the ringlets, right? Blonde, blue-eyed Pollyanna. And what does it say? Don't think, don't, you know, don't, right? One of the things that happens over and over in disability in film is disability, unlike this room, disability happens in isolation. You're the one disabled person in that whole damn town. There's no other disabled person. You don't have any friends with the same type of disability, with the same condition. You don't have your support groups. You don't have your Superfest. You don't have your Longmore Institute or Lighthouses. You're stuck in the back room of the house somewhere, hidden away, right? And so it's up to the non-disabled cute kid to show you the error of your ways. So take it out of isolation. Remember, super fast, the power of the DC is yours and yours alone. So who wins the coveted DC? Is it dun, 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 Mary in the secret garden? Anybody? Come on, vote. That's kind of weak. All right. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. Is it Heidi in Heidi? <laughs> oh, hey, hey, everybody up at the top. How you doing? Hello. Good to see you. We actually sold out tonight. Do you realize that? People are up at the top. Or is it Pollyanna in Pollyanna? Haley Mills, anybody? Giving it up for Haley Mills? All right, judges. Can you confer? Is this, is this, I, can, I, can I make a judgment call on this one? And the winner was Heidi. Let's hear a rousing boo, everybody. One, two, three. Ooh. Beautiful. So, accepting the award, and this is a clear-cut winner, our first of the evening, I think. Accepting the award on behalf of Shirley Temple Black, who sadly could not be here this evening. Hey, she's off doing something with the UN, who knows. <laughs> is Christina Mills, the Deputy Director for the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers. Christina, she gets a yay, she gets a yay. I'm so inspired. The third category of the evening, the amazing three, the most amazing miracle. Because as we saw with Heidi, if you really want it, really, really, really want it, you can have it. Right now, think about how nefarious these, these, these sort of tropes are. If 
All you have to do is want it really hard. You can walk. You don't have to think about access. If you try really hard and you walk, then there's no need for ramps, right? No need for braille, because hey, if you really, really think about it, you can see, right? If you really want to bad enough, you can hear. You don't organize with other people. You don't come together. You don't say, we demand what you non-disabled folks take for granted. Because it's all down to us, isn't it? Right? It's not about society getting it right. It's not about you including those you forgot about in your able-bodied privilege, your non-disabled privilege. No, 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 it's down to me because I have to really, really, really want it. And so, exemplifying this, <laughs> we've got three films. And again, these things could have been done over and over again. The nominees for the most amazing miracle are Forrest Gump, Run, Forrest, run, right? Oh, that clip. Alan Mann in the film Monkey Shines. Brian De Palma. How many of you know Monkey Shines? Prepare to be wowed. It's unlike anything you've ever seen before or heard. And I love this. She's so great. It's such a miracle. She doesn't even get a name. The blind girl. The blind girl. That's all we need to know. The blind girl in City Lights. The most amazing miracle. <laughs> it's a miracle! Free of the braces, he pumps his arms and races down the road in perfect form. He looks to his right, then darts his eyes to the monkey. If only I could move. Yes, I can see now. <laughs> Love really can cure blindness. <gasps> so what do we got? Just to recap real quick. Forrest Gump. Now it... Now, remember, this, this sort of revisits where we were with Heidi. But to heighten the tension a little bit with it, we have the gang of boys on bicycles. And I don't, he not only doesn't even just walk, he runs. The guy becomes Carl Lewis all of a sudden. Oscar Pistorius, he's booking down the road, right? So it's super inspirational. So what do we say? The, the next one, Monkey Shines. I'm not asking you to vote yet. Oh, man. I mean, this film has a little bit of everything. It was George Romero, right? Night of the Living Dead, who had something to do with this. Um, um, you've got, okay, so you've got a service animal, right? And you've got, huh. you can interpret that any damn way you please. This is San Francisco. You've got the syringe. You've got the sweet music. And if you've ever heard the phrase, love bites, well, now you know it's true. <laughs> there's so much packed into that movie. If you haven't had enough of Monkey Shines, if you're not familiar with it, there's a music video. I'm not going to say what song, but just Google music video, YouTube, Monkey Shines, and look that thing up once you go home. You'll, you'll never forget it. And the last film, City Lights, the great Charlie Chaplin, right? This is Island Era. Now, <laughs> and you've got a character so important that she doesn't even get a name, and, and she's been blind throughout this whole film, right? And then you get to the very end, and she realizes, she just goes, oh, oh, it's you, the tramp, Charlie. So let's vote. And I've been told, I've been told, you know, we've got three judges over here. I didn't mention this before because I didn't think it was significant, but, but in this crowd, I think we're safe. Our judges have a variety of different disabilities, physical, sensory, what have you. And right now, the folks who are making noise are getting a bit of an edge. All right, so the folks with cerebral palsy or whatever, you know, they aren't spazzing it up quite enough. Our deaf judge can't make sense of who you're voting for. So you've got to really move so that we can make sure that your vote is counted in addition to being heard, okay? Remember that as we vote. Remember you're being filmed. This will be recorded forever. The first in this category, the most amazing miracle, Forrest Gump. Yeah. 
I think I know who's going to win this. The second, Monkey Shines. And the third, the blind girl in City Lights. Judges? We have official word. Give me a drum roll, stomp. Stomp. Brrr, thank you. Surprise, surprise. The winner is Alan Mann in Monkey Shines. <laughs> Accepting the award. Sadly, the monkey couldn't be here because the monkey's dead. <laughs> uh, is Joshua Mealy who's an associate scientist. Of course, we had to have a scientist receive this award at the Smith Kettlewell Eye Research Institute. Joshua? No? Oh, there we go. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, it's such a pleasure. I'd like to thank the members of the Academy and the judges. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and the monkeys and all of that. Um, I do want to um, I do want to um, again ask you to give it up for this crazy description. Please, everybody, recognize that this is not your grandmother's description anymore. In general, <laughs> woo! Thank you. Um, this was this description was uh, created by um, a, a description company in LA that is owned and operated by blind people who understand what it is we need from description. They can create straight description, real, like, you know, TV-ready description as well. But this is, this is a challenge and something so exciting and delightful that they wanted to do. Because the truth is that most description is vanilla. And um, there's, this, there's this idea that you've got description um, there's the idea of impartiality in description. And let me tell you something, that description is necessarily and inherently an act of editorialism. It is always a judgment. So you might as well stop pretending that you're a reporter in the love scene <laughs> and just describe what you see and describe it the way you want to describe it. They've done an amazing job. And thank you to Audio Eyes and Rick Boggs who did this um, for us. Thank you. Woo! So much. Um, so uh, you know, I um, I'm not really uh, I shouldn't accept this award. Um, I met somebody just a little earlier who really should accept this because he um, he came up from Hollywood to um, to be with us tonight. And um, so I want to I want to introduce um, uh, my uh, my new my new friend um, Manny's an asshole. So just just. <laughs> 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 I love you. <laughs> this is wonderful. I am so glad. That guy, Josh, let's hear it for Josh Mealy. Wonderful, wonderful. Josh, somebody help him down those stairs. Step, step, step. He was so great. I saw him drinking a beer earlier, and he did not miss his mouth one time. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. You people are so inspirational. I will say, ladies, gentlemen, blind people. <laughs> <laughs> people in wheelchairs, you funny talking people, everybody. This is great. I am so pleased to be here. I love Cripple. Oh, sh I wasn't supposed They told me not to say. Oh. I forgot. You're differently crippled now. I I'm sorry. I am sorry. I think I'm, it's people with crippleness. I am really, I am a huge fan, though. Love you. Mwah, mwah. And let me say, that it is so great that your mothers could dress you up and bring you out tonight. <laughs> this is really special. I, I, it is such an incredible honor for you that I am here. <laughs> and I do want to say, I do want to say that I have been, I have been a friend to the differently crippled for a very long time. I have been producing these movies. I was a seventh producer on, on the Monkey Shine movie that you just saw. I produced the, uh, the DVD credits for another one of these uh, forest dish movies, and I almost slept with Glenn Close one time. But I did. And with, with, the, with the war, with the U.S. at war, we have made great strides in uh, 
um, prosthesis. We've created all kinds of things, and Hollywood is here to support everybody who has prosthesis. And I, in fact, just last week, I, I had somebody on my casting couch who had a pair of fabulous prosthesis, and we have really, we, we are here to support everybody with the, with the crippledness. So, okay, so, and I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna finish up, and I just wanna say that that guy, Josh Mealy, you know, I told him, and this is why I'm a friend to, the, to the, your, your, your people, okay? <laughs> I said to him, you know, because I understand, and he understands me, obviously. I said to him, you know, if I was you, I think I'd kill myself. <laughs> and he says to me, you know, I think if I was you, I'd kill myself. <laughs> so thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Manny's an asshole. Thank you very much. We love truth in advertising, don't we? That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. Thank you, Joshua. So, speaking of killing yourself, that's not a recommendation. That's not a suggestion. That's the next category. The most tragic. Uh, can we have an all? Uh, the most tragic character with a disability. What are we talking about here? Well, for this one, there are so many within this category, so many things which could apply for tragedy, right? Because you're right, you're heroic or you're tragic. There are four, four different options to choose from. What do we have? Well, 2005, a man named Clint Eastwood made a movie about a boxer. Uh-oh. Hey, I'm just the messenger. Didn't tell anybody about the third act of this movie, right? That was the secret. And I got to tell you, Million Dollar Baby is the name of the film. And uh, you'll see in the clip um, why this is considered tragic. Option two, son of a woman. Hoo-ha! Al Pacino becoming a caricature of himself. For your entertainment, Mr. Holland's opus, Mr. Richard Dreyfus, And from the 70s, because we can't forget the 70s, the other side of the mountain. Ooh. I'll talk a little bit more about them after the clips. But Idol, check them out the for The most tragic. I don't know what my daddy did for Axel. The man frowns. Do you understand? I'm in the dark! Pacino closes his useless eyes. <laughs> that's going to help. He turned when I did that big smile. He thought I was playing a game. Iris. I don't think he can hear. Take it from a veteran gimp. You gotta see what you are and say what you are before you'd be willing to work with what little you've got left. Audra Joe gathers her crutches. So, to recap real quickly, what do we got? Million dollar baby. Boo. So as you might recall, that film caused a lot of controversy when it came out. 2004, 2005, somewhere in there. My first published movie review, sort of letter to an editor, some paper in Australia somewhere, was about Million Dollar Baby. If Clint Eastwood is to be thanked or maybe blamed for anything, it's about getting me into doing disability rights work. Yeah, give it up for that, that's good. Because even though I'd had cerebral palsy my entire life and I'd identified, uh, I never was part of community. And when I went to the movie theater to see this film, I saw it with, you know, what seemed to be a non-disabled audience. Everybody expected. She's a boxer in that film. And so you think you're going to get Rocky in a sports bra. Woohoo! Well, at the third act, she gets sucker punched, goes down, breaks her neck, bing, bam, boom. Right? She's better dead than disabled all of a sudden. And the audience there that I saw the film with Everybody except for me applauded at the end. Now, if you haven't seen it, 
I'm not saying you should subject yourself to two hours of this stuff, but um, when she talks about what her daddy did for Axel, Axel's the old dog that they had. And when Axel got too old, they did an old yeller, right? And they put Axel down. So she's asking Clint in his grizzled voice to put her down like the old dog, right? Because she, she's better off that way. Now, I wanted to say as I'm watching this, right, she said, oh, I was born two pounds, six ounces. Well, I was like, hell, I was born two pounds and six ounces, right? You know, she talks about how she was in magazines. I'm thinking, yeah, Christopher Reeve was in friggin' magazines. Basically the same injury, right? She's talking about people chanting her name. Well, yeah, people have been chanting Michael J. Fox's name for months and then they started talking about his show coming on the air. I'm like, hey, lady, come on, you can make it. You don't have to put up with Clint Eastwood forever. <laughs> right, and so he puts her down. Second film, Scent of a Woman. Because, you know, blind people smell better than everybody else. <laughs> Says what women smell like, I'm not gonna go there. Um, I didn't, I'm just, you know, okay. <laughs> so Al Pacino is blind, Chris O'Donnell is his caregiver. This is before O'Donnell had done that awful Batman movie. And the dialogue pretty much speaks for itself, right? Pacino thinks his life is over. He's in the dark here. The dark! Man, he's back. And, um, right? And so he needs Chris O'Donnell to sort of snap him to his senses. Mr. Holland's opus, what the clip doesn't tell you is that Richard Dreyfuss's character in this um, is a music teacher. So to add to the pathos of the whole thing, right, you've got a music teacher whose child is deaf. Let's have an ah. Ah. So it's going over the top, the camera's panning to the boy, it's staying on a boy, cute little boy, you know, which is, if it was an ugly kid, you wouldn't care, right? It was a cute little kid, so that really adds the tragedy, ratchets it up. And then you've got the other side of the mountain, you know, we got an athlete, again, another athlete. I don't think we would have had Million Dollar Baby if we hadn't had other side of the mountain. Whoopee. So coming to terms with her new identity. She's even got a crip, right, telling her what the score is, what the scope is. She, she doesn't want to hear it. Right, <laughs> right. So now it's up to you. Are you ready? The, the, the what's this, the most tragic. Is it the million dollar baby? I didn't see you shake it around out there. Remember, let's be completely accessible. Um, scent of a woman? Yeah. Mr. Holland's opus. Oh, man, that was anemic. All right, and um, the other side of the mountain. <laughs> Woo, this is going to be tough. All right, so I think we can get rid of Mr. Holland's opus. I'm going to have to ask you again, just to make sure it's clear to the judges. We got three that were pretty neck and neck by, my, by how much shaking around I saw. So Million Dollar Baby, if you really like it, give it up. <laughs> Do it for Axel. Son of a woman. And the other side of the mountain. Woo, judges. You have a decision. That was quick. All right. And the winner is, can we stomp? Can we holler? Can we get the winner is? Dun, 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 dun. I'm eager for this. All right. Thank you. Couldn't happen to a better film or a worse film. Million Dollar Baby. Sadly, Hilary Swank could not be here with us today. Neither could Clint Eastwood because he would fear for his life. Come on, Clint, you're, you're better dead than in a room full of cripples. Um, <laughs> right. Um, accepting the award for Clint and Hillary, is Victor Pineda.
Victor, the man for whom, if it weren't for him, this would not have happened, a postdoctoral fellow at UC Berkeley. Take it away, Victor. So Cliff asked me to take this award <laughs> because he knew I was the most messed up crip he knew. <laughs> and he said, being the most tragic, most cripped up person that I have ever met, you must represent me to all those people and tell them just, tell them, Tell them I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for making them realize how tragic they really are. <laughs> I'm sorry for their inability to see and hear. And I'm sorry for bringing up such difficult subjects that are so hard to deal with. And I said, Clint, I'm sorry that you're such an idiot. <laughs> I'm sorry that you don't know how much life and, and power there is on this side of the table. I'm sorry that everybody that has these perspectives of how unfulfilling our lives are, I'm sorry that you're missing out. And most importantly, <laughs> I'm sorry that you aren't able to see all of the talent and all of the breadth and all the beauty that we have to share. And if you're not going to accept it, then just go away. That's what I wanted to tell him. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so, so in, in any case, being the most tragic, the most pathetic person in this room, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for this yeah. honor. Timmy! Thank you. So, <laughs> and if Quint, you know, gets uh, kneecapped, at some point in the next couple of weeks. I had nothing to do with it, I promise. <laughs> so, we're moving through the categories, and we've got the worst, this is a tough one as well, the worst disabled villain, right? Because if you're not the hero, if you're not tragic, what happens? I mean, if you're, you know, if you're tragic and you, and you become bitter, right, and you become angry, then you become the bad guy, right? There's nowhere else for you to go. If you're not going to be a hero, then you got to be a villain. Mr. Potter, right? You know, all of those characters, right? It's a wonderful life. Not for Mr. Potter. The Superfest invitation. Not, whoa. <laughs> Keeping me on my toes. Um, so the best villain, how do you do that? The worst villain, how do you do that? Well, here's what's significant about these categories. It's not just that the bad guy has a disability. It's that the bad guy is a bad guy because of the disability. The disability turned them that way. So who do we have? Pew and Treasure Island. We got a blind pirate here. Are you ready for that? Eye patch, right? Dr. Strangelove, Peter Sellers. Right? Stanley Kubrick, Mr. Glass in the film Unbreakable. Now, the worst disabled villain. Johnny, black dog, Wallace. Ironic Pew searches, hands outstretched instead of using his stick. To foster and impart the required principles of leadership and tradition. He pounds the arm of his chair with his left hand. His right flies up in the Nazi salute. He strains, then tugs the arm down. Actually, they would breed prodigiously, eh? I'm not a mistake. David walks off. It all makes sense. The mistake continues his prattle. The blind pirate, right? The last category, we had scent of a woman. What kind of sexist crap is that? Now we got the scent, and what would the scent of pew be? 
the evil guy, the evil pirate who gets run over right at the beginning. You don't even get to explore his character very much. Dr. Strangelove, there's a lot going on there. Unpack that puppy, right? So all of a sudden, he starts telling his tale, his vision for the future. What the hell is going on there? What is his disability anyway? He's got some hospital issue piece of crap wheelchair. Is it Tourette's? Is it cerebral palsy? What is going on with that arm, right? There's so many different things. They're not even, they don't even spell it out for you. You know, you're supposed to get it out. You find out he's a Nazi. You know, he's talking about eugenics, selective breeding. What is, there's so many different things to choose from that make him such a bad guy. And then Mr. Glass, the irony here, Mr. Glass, see he has osteogenesis imperfecta, brittle bone disease. Throughout the course of the film, Bruce Willis's character has been in an accident and all of a sudden he can't be hurt at all. He's in a plane crash, all this stuff keeps happening, not a scratch on him, right? So why is Samuel fucking Jackson so mad? <laughs> it's because, hey, he's not like that. You need that point counterpoint, right? The black and the white, ooh, that's not obvious. How much more blatant could this be, right? So they're there, they're the polar opposites of each other and then Bruce Willis's power, in addition to being invincible, is that when he touches somebody, he sees sort of their their greatest crime, their worst crime. So he realizes this guy who's supposedly his friend, who he really is, he's been betrayed. You know that because the music started playing. So add, all it, all, add it all up together. Who is the worst villain? Is it Pew from Treasure Island, the archetype, started it all? Not a, well, a little bit, a few. I see Jim LeBrecht out there. That's an, on, that's an honorable thing, Jim. Thank you. Pew needed something. Dr. Strangelove from Dr. Strangelove. It's a classic. Stanley Kubrick, Peter Sellers. All right. Or is it in the comic book shop, Mr. Glass in Unbreakable? All right, let's break it down again. Dr. Strangelove. Shake, rattle, and roll. Mr. Glass. The winner is, just like this guy, Dr. Strangelove. And, boo, let's do that with, with some passion and con some conviction. Dr. Strangelove. Ooh. Accepting the award on behalf of Peter Sellers, who couldn't be here because he's dead is Reverend Scott Rains. I'll do it. Scott. The Rolling Rains Report. As you could just tell. Thank you. I'm signing. I'm looking for my pen. The award, please. Here's the award. Somebody give him the award. He needs his prop. He hands him the Timmy Award, the Dissy. He's holding it in his uh, right hand. Okay. Loved right hand. Loved right hand, yes. Yeah, what's with that glove? On behalf of all the villains <laughs> that have ever accurately portrayed us in film, <laughs> I would like to accept this award. And I'd like to announce the after party in the silo, <laughs> where the relationship between male and female might be slightly modified, but we do have it for a hundred years. Thank you, sir. Hope you appreciate your time out. Enjoy yourself. So, what do you got? 
You got your heroes. You got your villains. You got they're so sweet they're not. But what we haven't seen yet, and I think that what's reflective of this night here tonight, this crowd here tonight, the energy here tonight is, are you ready? Crips gone wild. <laughs> no, Miley Cyrus did not break her foot. And running everything. Now, there were a ton of comedies for this category. Scenes where a disabled person is just a total buffoon, humiliating themselves, those they love, clueless about the mayhem that they're causing. What are the films that we had to narrow this down to? Well, you've got Carla in The Other Sister. I think this is pretty straightforward. You'll be able to make it out for yourself. You've got Radio in Radio. And you've got Danny in Blind Dating. The clips, please. Please don't do that. Please, you're disrupting me. Carla Pants. She's definitely on the spectrum. <laughs> From the sidelines, radio yells, reverse. Come back here, come back here. What are you, he's telling the play. Danny stops where he rehearsed, turns right, and sits at a table occupied by a Japanese couple. Oops, still blind. So, answering the eternal question, who let the dogs out? It was Carla and the other sister, right? And all the rich, snooty people, right? They're not acting like these are chihuahuas or golden retrievers. They're acting like they're mountain lions or something, the way they're hopping out of the way. You got radio. It's the big game, the last game, the big game of the season, right? Don't let the guy out of the institution for the day because he's going to screw it for everybody. He's going to ruin it for the whole team. And Danny and blind dating, what can you say? Right? Don't get yourself a service animal. Don't let the maitre d' know you're blind. Don't, you know, any of this stuff. Just fumble around the darn room. Why did the waiter fall? No one knows. None of this is explained. So, the crippin is crip. The wildest of the wild. Tons of nominees. We narrowed it down to these three just for you. Is it Carla and the other sister? Think about this film, too. You've got Julia Lewis, you've got Diane Keaton, right? They should know what they're doing, <laughs> right? Radio, radio, Cuba Gooding Jr., right? Uh, what do you think? Don't let the intellectually disabled guy near the football team at all. Or is it Danny in Blind Dating? Well, I think that was pretty clear, but let's go through the formalities here. Judges? Yes, and your decision is? Danny and blind dating. Now, accepting for Danny, because he'd never make it into the room, obviously, without destroying the building, is Yomi Rong, Executive Director of the Center for Independent Living. Thank you. Always wanted a Timmy, so now I have. One. Can we all say it now? She said the magic word. Are you I ready? Did say one, Timmy. two, three. Timmy! All right. All right. So I just wanted to be serious for a minute because everybody's been a little bit funny up here, and it is funny. It's nice to be in a room full of people who actually get it, who we can laugh about these things and deconstruct and critique at the same time. And I want to thank the Lighthouse and the Paul uh, Longmore Institute and um, everybody who put on this program that allows us this space to be able to do this. And I look forward to a day when we actually have more serious films that we can be proud of. Thank you. Thank you. We're doing that next year, don't worry. So, we can't believe it. Here we are, the end of the night. We've got one more category. <laughs> I know it's sad. Dry your tears. What could that category be? What is left to discover, to explore, to dissect, to dismember? Uh, 
Well, because this is an insider crowd, and it's our turf, and it's our rules, and we get to decide who wins and who loses, it was very important that when you know people try to come into our turf and show what's funny and what's not funny, they get it wrong often. So we needed to remind them that, hey, only we can laugh at that, which is this last category. So there's bad taste, disability humor, where they got it wrong. Very often they're uncreative, they're lazy, laughing at disability, uninformed rather than with it, right? So what do we got in these clips? Uh, another film that caused an uproar when it was made. This film I like to talk about, you know, there was a huge, there was a character, it sort of spoofs or it attempts to spoof Hollywood. And the fact that Hollywood, if you want to get an Oscar, you portray a disabled character. And there was a character that they ended up cutting from the film, played by Ben Stiller, called Simple Jack. And that was Tropic Thunder. Now, they had, a, in Robert Downey Jr.'s character in this film, was a white actor who wanted to, you know, really embody his role so much that he got injections and operations to become a black man, right? And there was a real live black man who was calling him on it. Every stupid thing that he did, quoting the Jeffersons, you name it, the real African-American guy called him out on it and said, oh, that was, what, are you, what the hell are you doing, dude? So in this, there are some other clips, though, some things in the film that have been not dissected quite as much because of the uproar over that, and you'll see um, what they're doing with developmental disability. I like to call what happens in Tropic Thunder, because it's laughing at us, not with us, um, satirization without representation. Because unlike the African-American character, nobody asked the disabled community what we thought. And this is the kind of nonsense that you got. The second film tried to do it a little better, questionable as to whether or not it succeeded. They got on board groups like Special Olympics. But any film with Johnny Knoxville, you know you're going to have some trouble. And this film is called The Ringer. Right? So it's a guy pretending to have a disability so that he can win a bet. And the last, Waking Ned Divine. One of those British comedies, right? We got three clips spliced together. And uh, we can maybe discuss it a little bit afterward, but I think it speaks for itself. So only we can laugh at that. The clips, please. Yeah, I did. It was like pistol whipping a blind kid. I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, Tug. My name is Lance, and I like nuts. In costume, in front of the mirror. My name is Fossil, and I can count the potato. Lizzie, stop squeezing the bread, please. It is all stale anyway. It certainly is an art. It came in fresh this morning. Try to be insider, but you're an outsider. What happens? Well, you get it wrong. So what do you have? What, it, what Before the fade out there in Tropic Thunder, you go to the photograph, and it's, it's Matthew McConaughey's character sitting here with the child who sort of is supposed to obviously visibly be intellectually disabled, you see. They sort of have that same look on the face that the Simple Jack character or the Forrest Gump had or all those other things that we've seen before. So that's the kind of gotcha in that film. Um, the Ringer, right? Laughing at, not laughing with. There's a later scene in that film where you've got a bunch of folks with actual intellectual disabilities confronting him in the uh, locker room, threatening to beat the stuffing out of him. I like that one much better. And uh, Waking Ned Divine, you know, it's supposed to be one of those full Monty kind of uh, lovely, you know, UK films. But again, you've got the evil disabled person, Karma, comes in at the end, and she gets hers. So, who is it going to be? Is it going to be Tropic Thunder? All right. This is our last category, so you've got to really give it up. The Ringer? Or Waking Ned Devine? All right, judges, do you have a clear-cut winner? And that winner is, let's do a little drum roll here, and the winner is, brrrr, and the winner is, the ringer. 
Let's give it a big boo. Boo! All right, so accepting the award on behalf of Johnny Knoxville and the Farrelly brothers, actually uh, executive produced this thing, believe it or not, is Anthony Tussler, styling and profiling, coming up the ramp, disability consultant and advocate, seller of Crip Culture t-shirts, I've got mine. Anthony, accepting on behalf, he gets his... What'd you say? He said it was his own what? Timmy! Timmy! Okay. Better? Much better. I want to thank all of the disabled people who have been the objects of humor for, throughout all the years and how wonderful it is that we can provide such, such inspiration for both tragedy as well as comedy. And it's just, it is, a, it is an enormous treat to have not only my own Timmy, but to be able to be here today and this evening and really to be a part of something where the community gets together and we get to be ourselves, who we are, and talk about what we are and who we are. And in the meantime, also maybe make a dig or two out there of the people of the world who stereotype us and put us in funny little boxes. So. Thank you all, everyone, and thank you. Thank you. So, did you have a good time? Are you thrilled that Superfest is back? All right, we gotta do our thank yous. Our thank yous, all the community supporters, the people on the program, the Superfest committee, the people that brought me out here, Brian Bashan, Emily Smith, Batix, Leonidas, oh, I got this wrong, I was asking before, Leonidas Gamicius, is that right? Did I get it right? Yeah. All right. Catherine Kudlick, <laughs> Kathy, thank you. Jennifer Sachs, Alex Wilson. Let's give him a big hoo -ah. Yeah, hoo -ah! <laughs> We want to thank our videographers, did you have something to want to thank our videographers? Oh, from the San Francisco uh, State University Academic Technology uh, uh, Department. Notice they're going to be back there. See our paparazzi corner, our celebrity corner. They're going to be videotaping people, so make sure you stop by. Our video editors, Natalie Zayas Bezon and Mike Chang, thank you. All of our volunteers, thank you. The Women's Building, thank you. And just a personal note. Um, events like this don't happen in a vacuum. And they don't happen without you. You know, often we've, we've, you know, one of the slogans that's been sort of trumpeted around and trotted around for a couple of decades now is nothing about us without us, right? It's one of the sort of maxims and slogans of the disability rights movement, the advocacy, disability justice. But I think that slogan assumes nothing about us without us, that there's things that are not about us, right? Some things are not about us. <laughs> but the beauty of Superfest is that we recognize that even if you're not disabled now, if you don't identify now, right, you might have a brother, a mother, a cousin, a sister who becomes disabled, and it impacts not only the disabled person, but the entire family. So I'm thinking maybe it's time that we start thinking about nothing without us, period. <laughs> period. Right, we're no longer standing outside the door. Please, sir, may I have some more? Right? Asking us, begging to let us in. No, we're saying, we're not asking you to invite us to the table. No, 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 no. We built this table. We convened the meeting. We invited you, right? So all those decisions, everything that happens in the world that involves us, it could be any of us at any time, we make it happen. We drive that engine. So you showing up tonight, 
you coming back next year, you letting the White House and the Longmore Institute know that you support this work is vitally important because if you don't show up, it doesn't happen. You know, I've had to sit through 230 movies, right? <laughs> and at, at this, this, I would watch about 10 or 15 movies before I would pick one. Do you know what that does to a person? <laughs> it's frightening. But tonight, with events like Superfest, we get to make the rules, we get to pick the crowd, we get to call the shots and be the show. So my word of thanks is to you. Thank you for showing up, thank you for being here, thank you for doing what you do, because without that, none of this would happen. And it was, oh, my honor. Absolutely an honor and a privilege. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming tonight. You know, somebody mentioned they were looking forward to a time when we're talking about films that we do like, right? Movies that we do like. And we don't want to forget those, but we thought it was important as we reboot, as we move forward, to take a brief look back to understand why celebrating who got it right was important. Because until you see what's wrong, you don't have that counterpoint. You can't quite see sometimes what's right and know what's right. So we're going to move. We know what Hollywood has done. People are doing it for themselves. We're doing it for each other. We're moving it forward into the next generation. You're super, super fast. It's super. Thank you very much. Let's move it forward. Thank you. <laughs>